Greetings shippers, welcome back. And I hear you all, you want the ineffable husbands. Aziraphale and Crowley have had quite the resurgence of interest in their ship thanks to the release of Amazon's 2019 adaptation, which translated the angel and demon to the small screen in a way that served to introduce many fans to the 6,000 year slow burn for the first time. It also served to remind some of their love for these two, or just as a finally moment for some who had been on board all along. We will give the ineffable husbands their day and discuss their pairing in full, as well as the variances between book and series and how that has affected the fix one will find. But firstly, let us discuss what many have dubbed the Good Omens fandom renaissance by examining this fandom's history. If you're enjoying the burst of fandom attention on Good Omens, hit that like button. First off, before we get started, exciting news. We here at Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy are launching a new channel, Casually Comics. Fun, upbeat, and casual comic reviews. So if you love comics and keeping it casual, head on over and subscribe. First episode is about the fabulous team up between Spider-Man and Superman. Yes, you heard that right. Now for us shippers, let's talk Good Omens. Good Omens is a novel and co-project between Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, who actually split the work fairly evenly, with Pratchett saying of the process, I think this is an honest account of the process of writing Good Omens. It was fairly easy to keep track of, because of the way we sent discs to one another, and because I was keeper of the official master copy, I can say that I wrote a bit over two thirds of Good Omens. However, we were on the phone to each other every day at least once. In the end, it was this book done by two guys who shared the money equally and did it for fun and wouldn't do it again for a big clog. The accounts match up. With game and stating of the process, we were both living in England when we wrote it. An educated guess, although neither of us ever counted, Harry probably wrote around 60,000 raw, and I wrote 45,000 raw words of good omens. With on the whole, Terry taking more of the plot with Adam and the them in, and me doing more of the stuff that was slightly more tangential to the story. Except that broke down pretty quickly, and when we got towards the end, we swapped characters that we'd both written everyone by the time it was done. And by the end of it, Neither of us was entirely certain who had written what. It was indeed plotted in long daily phone calls, and we would post floppy disks. And this was back in 1988, when floppy disks really were pretty darn floppy, back and forth. The book was published in 1990, and was quickly embraced by a variety of fantasy genre fans, and also to shippers, who were captivated by the deep and all-encompassing friendship between Angel Aziraphale and Demon Crowley. Characters who were opposites in some ways, and yet so fundamentally similar in others, with shared loves of earthly pleasures, and a belief in free will. Characters who could ponder deep philosophical ideas one moment and be completely farcical the next. Characters who shared a relationship that was relatable to so many on a variety of levels. And thus, the ship was born, and has continued on with dedicated fans and new ones coming on board as they discover the novel. However, over time, the flow of fix and works slowed. Not only because of how long it had been since the book was released, 29 years, but because it was a book and book fandoms bookdom, traditionally tend to be smaller than ones based off of a visual medium, as many require the seeing of the character's chemistry rather than the extrapolation required from a book, though some prefer bookdom for just that reason. It allows more room to explore, and some find the characterizations and moments more vivid as a result, though it can be a harder sell, as can books in general for some people. Though of course there are exception book fandoms, and when a bookdom explodes, it tends to do so with a longevity and ferocity that can rival any visual-based fandom. However, when a work remains more niche, it can be harder to maintain a highly active vocal fan base, especially pre the internet, as getting in touch with other book fans could be a bit difficult. Though people found ways, and the Good Omens fandom definitely found some. However, Good Omens arose at the very beginning of the digital fandom era. Indeed, some produced their first fix on floppies. So some fans had accepted that this was the type of fandom Good Omens was, quick to grab those who stumbled upon it, and an important part of the fandom's history, particularly involving an intriguing twist on Wingfic, and generally a good place to hang out, but not one that was going to be highly active. However, all that changed with the announcement of an adaptation, a transference to visual media that opened up the work to a whole array of new fans who have begun creating their own works and been pleased to find a pre-existing and welcoming fandom, even if there is a difference between book and movie characterization, which is neither a positive or a negative, simply a fact. So some will cross post, and some will stick to one of the medium's fandoms, though there is a bunch of cross pollination. This has been dubbed by some fans the Good Omens Renaissance, a phenomenon that occurs when a fandom gets a second wind, an influx of new life, and sometimes this can propel it onto firmer or more accessible ground, as certainly seems to be the case with this Amazon adaptation for a variety of reasons. 
One of which is Neil Gaiman's willingness to discuss fandom and shipping, something he's never exactly shied away from, but with the modern era has come a new boldness from fans that he has risen to meet while still maintaining his own vision. Though this is hardly surprising, as Gaiman himself has a background in fanfiction. An early adopter of Tumblr, he is still on there and even had some fun things to say about a certain suggestive wrestling statue located in Crowley's apartment, stating, The statue in Crowley's flat. It represents, said the production designer Michael Ralph, good and evil wrestling and evil triumphing. Are you certain they're wrestling? I asked. Gaiman has long been open about his history with fanfiction, even responding to someone who was less in favor of the concept in the following 2017 exchange. Do you like fanfiction? I'm pretty against it. I think it's an insult to the author. Hey, so I took what you wrote and well, I made it all about me and what I want. It's not how stories get told. Twitch Gamer replied, I won the Hugo Award for a piece of Sherlock Holmes slash HP Lovecraft fanfiction, so I'm in favor. He is also very much in favor of fanfiction being a space where fans can answer details and questions for themselves. Responding to a question posted on Tumblr about whether or not Crowley and Azira Fail had met Cleopatra by stating the following. I can't answer that, or rather, there's no point to my answering it. That's why you write fanfiction, to tell those stories, to make up those details. That's not something I answer yes or no to, and it doesn't matter if I do or don't. You're the one with the what if, or the wouldn't it be interesting if. That starts a story here. You'll get a lot of answers to questions you didn't know you have when the TV series comes out. It's your call whether you decide that the TV series is canon or only the book. They rarely contradict each other, but one might exclude fictions or create fictions that the other wouldn't. This is not only endearing for many a shipper, who are more used to being told off by creators and understood by them, but also opens an interesting discussion of what separates fanfiction from official, legitimate literature. Gaiman implies that he is aware the line is thin, even as he seeks to maintain that line. That being legitimacy. The difference between a fanfic and an inventive reimagining is simply at times whether one is published or not. It is that official publication that gives the aura of legitimacy, as fanfiction by definition is fiction written by a fan of and featuring characters from a particular TV series, movie, etc. But more broadly, it is taking characters not of one's own and working with them in a fictional setting. Many official works do this, and the authors themselves are fans. A distinction in line in the sand that some attempt to draw, creating a world wherein the author is above such activity. However, some argue that one could view many of Gaiman's works as fanfiction, for example, Good Omens, which could be regarded as biblical fanfiction. Whether or not one takes offense to this has a lot to do with their views on fanfiction itself, which are often negative, as fanfic tends to be labeled as a pejorative, synonymous with bad writing. However, that is not always the case. There are good fanfics and bad ones, just as there are good and bad published works. Fanfic still lives in a world of being a dirty secret, a sign of obsession, and no life. However, should one get the same work published, it can be viewed as brilliant. Unless it was a fanfic first, and people become aware of that fact, then it will be judged as a fanfic. Which is not to say that it might not be bad, because it could be. It really comes down to whether fans embrace the work and the confidence the author and publisher have in it, and what slash who the characters and topic are. For example, fairy tales or myth will be much less likely to be viewed as fanfic than a twist on a more modern published work, and some simply don't question something if it is official, just by virtue of it being so. For if it is an official published work, it must be original and creative. This again because of the preconceived notions that fanfiction is not only poorly written, but unimaginative. That those creating it cannot simply come up with their own ideas. Now, of course, not all fanfic is good or a masterpiece, and there is definitely something to be said for someone who dedicates themselves to writing professionally, but there can also be a large amount of love and dedication put into fanfic. While many would argue the distinction and separation is necessary, what they feel is not is the disdain sent towards fanfic, and that even if it can be acknowledged that they are different, there is no need to put down those who enjoy fanfiction. Some feel it could even be viewed as its own subgenre. Mileage very much varies on the use of pre-existing characters, but we've gone on long enough. For those who are fans of fanfiction, they not only feel that it can be a good place to hone one's craft, but that many great works are built off of the bones of others, or inspired by them, and that that is nothing to shy away from or be ashamed of. By embracing fanfiction, it not only makes Gaiman more understanding of his fan base and able to answer their questions, even if he does not agree with their views, but adds a layer of humbleness to works that could be found to be pretentious. Of course, some find them pretentious anyway. Gaiman has been asked about Crowley and Aziraphale, particularly since the 2019 series series, with one exchange going as follows. So, at Neil himself, they're gay, right? They're an angel and a demon, not male humans. Okay. But they love each other, right? Absolutely. Sweet. Although it would be quite hard to come out of this work, series or book, not knowing these two love each other very deeply. What kind of love it is may be up for debate 
but it is a pure and very real love, which is part of what has made this renaissance surge on so quickly. Many fans are surprised how fast they have become attached to these characters and their relationship, but that is a testament, pun intended, to how strongly their interactions speak to the depth of their bond even from the outset, only strengthened by the very real yin and yang star-crossed themes that are cleverly subverted. The actors for their part felt that it was very much a tale of romance, with Sheen stating, What happens if you're someone who just loves things, if you spend all your time with your supposed enemy? How does that work? And then eventually I just found myself, as a Xerophale, kind of falling in love with Crowley, and then that became kind of interesting to explore that beast. It's easier for me because I decided that early on that Aziraphale just loves Crowley and that's difficult for him because they're on opposite sides and mm -hmm. you know he doesn't agree with him on stuff yeah. but it does really help as an actor to go my objective in this scene is to eat is to not show you how much I love you <laughs> <laughs> and just gaze longingly at you all the time. that really does help but then Crowley absolutely loves Aziraphale and hates that he loves yeah. him it's really annoying for him <laughs> yeah. yeah so they're both good through that I think it's a buddy story, really. You know, it's a, it's a love story almost between these two, this unlikely odd couple, uh, who 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 love each other more than they would dare admit. This aspect definitely comes through in the performance. Now, aside from the initially mentioned exchange, Gaiman has been more specific about whether or not Crowley is canonically gay. And his response is interesting. He stated, canonically, which is to say using the text in the book, you don't get any description of Crowley's sex life. The only thing the book says is angels are sexless unless they specifically make an effort. You can infer, and more to the point, you can imagine, and lots of people have chosen not unreasonably to ship him with a zero fail, but you are still making stuff up. It could be making stuff up that happens happens between paragraphs or making stuff up that isn't mentioned at all, but it's still making stuff up. Some took offense to this. Others feel that it falls very much in line with the attitude he's always had about fan fiction, which basically boils down to make it, love it, create it, but canon does also still exist. But that shouldn't stop you from enjoying and creating your fan fiction. All of this opens up a discussion which is fascinating to have, and this is one of the better fandoms to have it in, as it is one of the less toxicity-fueled ones. And this open discussion helped in part to fuel the growth of this boom. For while fanfic is still looked down upon, it is paradoxically more discussed than ever, and purported to be celebrated on many nerd-based sites, though many fans feel they are being exploited for clicks, rather than out of genuine interest in the subculture itself, though people's motivations are varied, so it would be disingenuous to paint all outlets with the same brush. What is certain is that the ineffable husbands are thriving, the tags are glorious, Crowley's eyes are love, as are these two soft boys, dorks in love, or however these two are being defined. The 6,000 year slow burn has definitely come to an end. How long the boom will last remains to be seen. But for the time being, it is a great time to be a fan of these two and their pairing as well as the work. Now, of course, not everyone is a fan, as with all things, but we will get into that when we discuss the ineffable husbands in depth. For now, are you enjoying the burst of ineffable husbands? If you're a shipper, did you just get on board, or have you been sailing the seas for some time? If you're a book fan, did you feel the series did these two justice? Why or why not? And finally, the big one. Do you agree with Gaiman's stance of the friendly but firm separation of fanfic from canon? Share all of your thoughts down below. Thanks so much for watching. There are as always more videos coming soon. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Special thanks to all my patrons' names on the side for helping to make these videos possible. I will see you all again when I can, and until then, let's get to that outro, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.